Sal Berry, and Tim Parrish. This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Berry and with me is Tim Parrish. And today we are going to talk about how to complete your hockey card sets. That's a question that I get a lot. Like, It's a question that people ask me like, hey, I have some sets that I want to complete. How do you recommend I finish them off? Because there is a myriad of ways to do that now. It's not like the 1990s when you brought your cards with you to school and traded with your friends during lunchtime uh, or whatever, good times. Um, Now there's all sorts of ways to uh, complete your sets, finish your sets. we're going to talk about uh, also a special upper deck card that is available on EPAC. And we're also going to um, talk about some of the, uh, I guess we'll just say coaches getting fired because, man, I mean, it's only still round one of the playoffs and coaches be getting sacked. I think the big, big, big one was Barry Trotz. But uh, Tim, sorry, man, I've been doing all the talking. How you doing? I'm not fired like some of these guys have been so that's that's good i'm already uh a step ahead of the myriad of coaches that have already been canned yeah we already have a ton of coaches and their staffs already already uh unemployed well i mean like okay so the two assistant coaches mark crawford being one of them and the other one um the uh video coach for the blackhawks i forget his name maybe you could refresh cookson right they were retained when colleton was fired so they were kind of part of Colleton's so old regime staff. guys cleaning it up. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was like when they promoted Derek King, they didn't promote his guys from Rockford. You know, they kind of just brought him up. And so I guess the thing is, is that if they retain Derek King, then he would f- hire his own assistants. And if they don't retain Derek King, then they would obviously not need jeremy colleton's assistant coaches you know so that's not surprising that would make sense but i think we were a little bit surprised by barry trotz being relieved of his coaching duties with one year to go on his contract with the islanders that's just lou lamorello being lou lamorello right did you hear did you hear his press conference no any chance oh man that is some sound bites for the ages right there Everybody, I mean, everybody that's familiar with Lou Lamorello and has followed his career around the league kind of knows how Lou is, and players talk about him all the time. Like, he's a great guy to play for, but Lou is Lou, and he wants things the way he wants them. The big crazy one is one of the things is he hates guys with facial hair. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't want guys to have be long-haired hippies and have facial hair, and he makes them cut it. So if you're going to play on one of his teams, you got to abide by his rules. And that's always been like a thing with Lou. And he's kind of quirky like that. But like you said, Lou being Lou, he goes and they're asking him all these questions. And he's basically, you know, the Reader's Digest version is, I don't have to answer questions because I don't have to answer to you. These are things between me and the owner of the team. They're decisions I make. I don't have to talk to the players. I don't have to consult with anyone except for the owner of the team. And we knew what we were going to do based on the information we had. And this is what we did. So I'll do what I want to do and run my team, how I want to run my team and everybody else can shut up. And that's essentially what it boils down to. And you can go and find it and I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of it. And I thought it was hilarious. That kind of reminds me of Rocky Wirtz and his, it's none of your business. You don't work for the organization. Oh, absolutely. So how is this different? Well, they're different topics to begin with. How's it different? Because we're talking about a guy firing a coach versus a guy that's trying to cover for a coach that molested a player. Systematic problems within the organization, other than not being able to win a hockey game. So you're talking about kind of two very different things there. It's just one of those things, you know. Guys are in control and they feel like they're infallible when it comes to making decisions. And that's fine. If that's how their organization works, then that's how it works. I mean, a lot of the guys that do commentary and things like that on 
the various networks that have played for him before have mm-hmm. come out and said, yeah, that doesn't surprise me because of how he's done in the past with New Jersey. He did the same thing, firing coaches before. So, well, like Claude Julian, when they yeah. fired, he fired Claude Julian and the Devils were in first place in their division. And he fired him before the playoffs started and stepped in his coach, if I remember correctly. But he said, I don't feel like we're ready for the playoffs and it's like uh you're in first place dude but okay cool go ahead fire your coach even though he coached a team to a first place finish and i don't think claude julian is a bad coach i mean maybe he's not scotty bowman but he's not mike keenan you know what i mean like when you think of like likable coaches i i would put claude julian on that list of coaches i'd also put barry trotz on that list of coaches you know what i mean and when i think of like you know, like coaches that I would like to play for or that I think players would like to play for. So I was a little yeah. surprised by that. Yeah, that, and that it is time. kind of surprising because he is one of those coaches that you think that is, is going to be in high demand and, you know, somebody that any team that has a coaching vacancy would probably look at as being in to replace. But, you know, to the bigger point, you know, Lou basically said, we have the makeup of a team that should not be where it ended up. And I think we need a new voice in the locker room is what it boiled down to. And it's like, if you look at that on paper, I mean, really, they're only guys that they could lose at the end of the year without intervening are Chara and I think Andy Green. They're the only unrestricted free agents right now. Mm-hmm. So essentially, this team is coming back. And this is the team that Lou built and the team that he's supporting. So, right. Yeah, he's he's given carte blanche to kind of do what he wants, and that's what he's doing. The crazy part is this guy's almost 80 years old. One story I want to tell, when I used to be really big into collecting autographs through the mail, and I did this a lot in the 90s, like the early to mid-90s, maybe from like 1990 to around 96 or 97, uh, and then I picked up again in 2006 to about 2013, 14, somewhere around there. So there were two times in my life where I was an autograph collector, where I would write fan letters to players. And I know in the 90s and I know in the 2000s, whenever I wrote to the New Jersey Devils, I never got my cards autographed. I'd always get my cards back unsigned with a form letter signed by Lou Lamorello thanking me for being a fan of the New Jersey Devils and how fans like you are important to our team, right? It was kind of like, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find a nicer way of saying cock blocking because it's <laughs> not that, but it's like, it's like uh, basically I'd write to a player and then like, I mean, would you say it, ink blocking, autograph blocking? I mean, I mean, uh, he's, essentially, he's essentially acted as a gatekeeper. That's all. Though. Yeah. I'd see a letter with a New Jersey Devils logo on it in my mailbox, and I'd be like, ugh, I already know what this is. And in the 90s, it would be a sheet of New Jersey Devils stickers, like six stickers. And sometimes there'd be another interesting thing in there. Like one time I got a New Jersey Devils bumper sticker. Another time I got like a rectangular shaped team photo, like after they won in 95, like a black and white team photo uh, with the player names written on it. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool. I mean, I'd get some cool things, but like, you know, I want to say I would get like an order form for the New Jersey Devils fan club, but I might be mistaking that with the Rangers because the Rangers were also notorious for sending me back a, uh, form letter that said thank you for being a Rangers fan and here's a sheet of stickers and here is a order form to join the Rangers kids club or something I mean never mind the fact that I was probably 20 at the time so yeah it was just like I I never had any success writing to Devils players because Lou would intercept my letter and or Lou's secretary and then throw in a form letter and a sheet of Devils stickers I'm sure you still have those stickers Somewhere, I gotta dig some of this stuff up. Now, thinking back 25 years later, it's kind of interesting. I mean, at the time, I was like, oh, I don't want this New Jersey Devils photo, but now I'm like, hey, you know, the 95 Devils were kind of cool because they bucked the system, if you think about it. I mean, you think about how, like, teams like the Islanders, the Oilers, and the Penguins, and then even the Calgary Flames, their MO was, we're just gonna obliterate the other team and score, like, 
way more goals than they do. Not even like two to one. We're just going to clobber them 10 to four. You know what I mean? And then you had the Devils come along. We're like, you know what? We're going to win games one to nothing. Because it doesn't matter if we win 10 to six or one to zero. A win's a win, right? So really, I mean, I was thinking about that today, how the Devils really changed hockey. Not for the better, necessarily, but how they changed hockey, just like the Broad Street Bullies changed hockey in the 70s, right? Where it was just like, all right, we're just going to beat the snot out of the other team and make them scared of us, right? And that's how we're going to win, through intimidation. And yeah, the Devils, Devils, it was like, we're just going to suffocate you. Yeah, we're going to basically bore you to death, and then you'll lose. That's that's Devils hockey. We're going to play 1-3-1. One, one. You're never going to be able to get the puck out of the neutral zone. And just you're gonna lose two to one, and every game's gonna be one nothing, two to one, and it's gonna be quiet. So when other teams are winning ten to eight, any Devils game, it's like four goals is like a plethora of goals. Right, right, right. Devils because of that that system, and you know, so, teams have yeah. played that throughout the years too, off and on throughout the playoffs and it's it's worked i mean tampa did that for a while columbus did that before and it worked so it's boring but sometimes it works obviously if barry trotz wants another job in coaching he'll have one that's not a problem i think it'll be interesting once the first round is over you know once things shake out the team that had maybe higher expectations they get eliminated in the first round and then that coach gets fired and then that coach is on the market, right? So, I mean, I think that's why teams like the Blackhawks, I think they're keeping Derek King in the wings and they're saying, yeah, we're going to talk to him because their interim GM is now their GM. And he's like, well, I'll give the interim coach a shot because I was the interim GM and they gave me a shot. But I think they're also kind of waiting to see who becomes available. You know, you kind of wait for like coaches to get fired as the playoffs go on. And then, uh, you make your, you try to make your move and have a coach in place before the draft. Well, and other than Barry so far, I don't think any of the coaches that got fired are head coaching material. I mean, look, Eiserman tossed the whole freaking coaching staff in Detroit. So Jeff Blaschel's out of a job. I don't think Blaschel, I don't think he gets another head coaching job, at least for a minute. And Philly tossed Mike Yo, even though he had the uh, interim tag on him. Mike Yo, I liked Mike Yo as coach in Wilkesbury. I liked him as an assistant coach. But man, he's every time he gets an opportunity to be head coach, it doesn't seem to work out too well. No, it doesn't. But uh, yeah. You know, the goalie coach for the Kraken got fired. I forget his name, but that made sense because they had like the worst goaltending in the league this year, even though they're an expansion team. And. I think the Devils got rid of uh, Mark Recchi and Elaine Nazardine, two other former players with Penguin ties. But they were both assistant coaches. Recchi's been bouncing around from team to team as assistant coach, but he gets put on special teams pretty much everywhere he goes. So mm. if the power play sucks, bye-bye. I go back and forth. Like I'm kind of interested in what the Blackhawks do because I'm in Chicago, but then I'm also kind of not interested because I'm still really pissed off at the way they – dealt with things. But I will just say this because I've joked about this on social media much of the time. Like if I could pick anybody to be a Blackhawk coach, I'd pick Peter Laviolette. I liked him. I always liked him. I was joking. I said, okay, we need the Panthers to beat the Capitals because I want the Panthers to win the cup. So the Panthers are going to beat the Capitals. Capitals are going to fire Peter Laviolette or p Lab as I like to call him. And then the Hawks will hire him as a coach. I don't even know if he'd be a good fit in Chicago. I just like him. He's the guy I'd want to be the coach. You know what I mean? You just like, want to you just want to see that experiment and see how it works out. Listen, there's a reason why I'm not an NHL GM. Although I did finish second in my fantasy hockey league, so there's that. Lost by one penalty minute, by the way. So it was close, even down and to the championship that, series. That qualifies you right there to manage the Coyotes organization. So heck yeah, I can manage the Coyotes organization. Let's yes. go to the waiver wire, you know, see who has a lot of penalty minutes this past week and and, and beef up that stat. You can actually move them from uh, playing at Arizona State in their 5,000-seat arena. 
can move them over here by me with a little rink arena that's got like 12 benches in the corner. Mm-hmm. You can play there. It's like when the Chicago Wolves play at Franklin Park Ice Arena, which is a suburb of Chicago. They'll play their preseason games at like local rinks and you can get tickets for like $10. And it's just like bleacher seats and it's only like one side of the arena you might have 300 fans in attendance but that's all this is that's where the high school teams play Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah exactly for a short moment in time they had a professional team playing there the shy town shooters they were a hockey team yeah didn't last very long i think yeah i don't remember years yeah i think that league only lasted a couple years it was a few uh, games and i know my oldest son who is now 18 he was really little then, so it was mm-hmm. quite a few years ago. So it'll be interesting to see how how the um, the coaching situation shakes out. You know, we had a lot a lot of turnover this year, and we're going to continue to have turnover. So you want to talk about a special hockey card that's available on Upper Deck EPAC? There's a really interesting story about this that actually has developed over the past couple of weeks. It's the card of uh, a young hockey fan by the name of Ben Stelter. Yeah, so you know Ben's a kid that, uh, and look, a lot of organizations do this, but this has gotten a lot of press. So, you know, a lot of organizations are really good with their fans and really good with their outreach programs, especially dealing with children's hospitals and things like that. Ben is a cancer patient and he's battling, you know, as a kid and he's a huge Oilers fan and the Oilers organization basically accommodated bringing him to a game, bringing him into the facility, letting him go out on the ice and skate with the guys for practice. Uh, There's all sorts of video of him being led around the the arena by Connor McDavid and, you know, getting an opportunity to do a lot of these things. And Upper Deck decided to contact the family and set up a, um, as part of the, you know, part of the event of him being able to go out, they were able to get a photo and they created a card for him. Uh, so he got his own trading card out of the out of the whole deal, and it's part of their heroic inspirations cards. Which this isn't the first one they've made. And Upper Deck does things like this on occasion. Most recently, you can think of their uh, the heroes cards that they did of frontline workers mm-hmm. um, during the initial stages of the COVID outbreak, and you know, so they do they do a lot of these these types of things. And uh, they made a heroic inspirations card of him. So this card features Ben on the ice with Connor McDavid and Connor's kind of like leaning over sort of in the photo, like leaning over and kind of talking to him and he's in the picture. And so they make these available at the game, at the Oilers game. Right. And fast forward, essentially a week, maybe two weeks. These cards are being sold on eBay for hundreds of dollars. Hundreds. People are trying to sell these cards. And they're trying to sell them as Connor McDavid cards. Look, here's a here's a here's a rare Connor McDavid. Now, meanwhile, the whole point of buying these cards was supposed to be the proceeds were going to go to help, you know, basically go to the the cancer organization. So Now, I don't know if this was the motivation for Upper Deck or if this was already in the works and planned, but I will say this. If this is a response to the fact that there's all these jerk-offs out there trying to make money off of these cards, then Upper Deck knocked this one out of the park. So they decided to make the card available to everyone on EPAC. So you can go on EPAC, you can pick one of these up, They're only available for a week. So as we speak right now, they're still available. You can buy a Heroic Inspirations pack. Basically open up your pack. The card will be added into your Upper Deck account. And then once the physical cards are created, based on how many they sell, you can have them shipped. Or you can leave them in your account or do whatever with them. And then if you decide you want to sell it later, so be it. The point is you can buy this 
for nine dollars and seventy cents. Why nine dollars and seventy cents? Well, ninety-seven. It's Connor McDavid's number. Mm-hmm. The net proceeds for that are going to be given to the Kids with Cancer Society of Edmonton. So you can go and get the fancy one that was given out at the Oilers games for three hundred off of some jerk off on eBay, or you can have nine dollars and seventy cents be donated to that organization and get one. Is it the same card between what they're giving away and what they're selling on EPAC? Because I think it is the same. I think it's the same. It's the, like it's the, the same back. picture on the front. Yeah. Same picture on the front. Of it. The back of the card has a little write up about Ben. It says two months before Ben's fifth birthday, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Since then, he's had two surgeries to remove the tumor, 35 radiation sessions, and four rounds of chemotherapy. Through it all, Ben never complains, always has a positive attitude, and is always trying to make those around him laugh. Ben loves the Edmonton Oilers and is a hockey fanatic. He loves skating, playing mini sticks, and road hockey. When he was three years old, he used to tell people his name was Connor McDavid. You could always spot Ben by his infectious laugh and smile. So there you go. Now, something I want to add, because Upper Deck did a similar card like this. It was about eight years ago. There was a young man still alive. He also had an illness, Sam Tagason, and he's a uh, San Jose Sharks fan. And he got to come out and skate with the Sharks. He was like maybe 16, so he's a little older. Um, but he got to skate with them during warm-up. And Upper Deck made a Young Guns card of him. But the Young Guns card was actually found in MVP. So even though it was an Upper Deck Series 1 Young Gun, which I think they made like a blow-up card for him, and then they decided to make the card available, and it was available in packs. I remember buying this card on eBay for maybe about $20, just because I like oddball cards like this. And also, I thought it was really cool that this young man, and he's actually, I want to say it was was cancer, maybe it wasn't, I, I can't quite remember, but I know that like, Uh, Like a year or two ago, I saw on Twitter, he's like, hey, I remember getting to skate with the Sharks five years ago, and it was a great night, and, you know, thank you to the Sharks, and thank you for, you know, to Upper Deck, and this really lifted my spirits when when I was battling this illness, and, and it really meant a lot to me. And so, you know, I said, oh, yeah, I remember that guy. I have this card, and I think it's cool. You know, I mean, I think the whole thing is cool. I mean, I think it's it's great that Upper Deck has been honoring other people with the heroic inspirations, and your wife was one of the frontline workers who had a card made, which is awesome. But when you told me that this card of Ben Stelter was selling for, like, $300, and I was thinking, wow, I mean— why that much for a card of a kid? But then when you said because people are selling it as a rare Connor McDavid card, and then that's when I'm like, oh, that is upsetting. You know what I mean? It's one thing if people go like, oh, this is a really cool card, and I want to have it for my collection because I collect all things Oilers or whatever. But when you have people jacking up the price because you're going to say, it's a Connor McDavid card and it was only limited to 5,000 copies or whatever, and like you're totally like just not even acknowledging – the reason why Connor McDavid is on that card, and that's to be supportive of this five-year-old child who's dealing with a serious illness, that is maddening. So I think it's great that Upper Deck is just saying, you know what, anybody who wants this card could have it for $9.70, and the proceeds go to uh, whatever cancer charity, and I, I think that's a great thing, you know. But yeah, I didn't even make that connection that like people would see it as like a McDavid card, because he's on the card, but... I have hockey cards that Connor McDavid is on, but it's not necessarily his card. He just happens to be in the background or whatever. Speaking of in the background, it's ironic that the last time they made something similar to this was with a Sharks fan. And in this card, in the background, Mm -hmm. it's the Sharks. Really? Visiting team. Yeah. Nice. So I just pulled up just real quick while you're talking, just closed auction sales. And this is what I did my search on eBay. I did Ben Stelter, Connor McDavid. That that was what the search was. Mm-hmm. Let me read you the last 10 sales here. Okay. $50, $58, $232, $213 with best offer, $133, $209, $219, $116. So the $300, I don't see any selling for $300, but they're all $50 plus. Some mm-hmm. of them in the hundreds. 
And here's the thing. Who are you buying this from? You're buying it from some guy that got a bunch of these and is trying to sell. Right. So you're just giving this guy hundreds of dollars. So right. whatever they cost at the time, or if they were giveaways or whatever, nothing is being you know, given to any of these charities or anything like that. So right. don't go on eBay and buy this. Quickly go to EPAC. Pick yourself up at least one. Donate to a good cause. Absolutely. That's that's my PSA. And and I don't mean graded. Oh, okay. Do you want to talk about our big topic now? Because I got a lot to say on this, and I you always have a lot to say about this. But I'm just gonna sit here and be quiet and listen to the expert talk. Oh, yeah, I'm the expert. You, you know, you and I both have sets that are like. 30 years old that still need cards. So I don't know how expert we are in 30. completing set. I've got stuff older than that. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Hold on. All right. Yes. You know what? I never completed my 67, 68 tops hockey set, but I wasn't alive back then. But I have sets from like the mid 90s that still need like a card or two. So, mm, you know, okay. Maybe that's not quite 30 years, but. You get my point. This year and last year, but probably like middle of summer last year and onward, I decided, you know what? I have a shelf full of incomplete sets, and I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to either complete them or I'm going to get rid of them because the older you get and the more things you get, space becomes more and more of a premium. So, Once upon a time, when I was building a set, I might put the cards in pages, even though there'd be cards missing, right? And I do that with my vintage cards, because those are always going to go in binders no matter what. But, you know, when I was doing that for, like, my 2010-11 Panini Adrenaline set, and then I think finally after, like, 10 years, I was like, you know what? I'm never going to finish this damn Adrenaline set, and I really don't care about it anymore, and I don't really want to spend $40 for a hollow foil uh, Henrik Sedin card or Daniel Sedin card or, you know, whoever, right? Henrik Zetterberg or what, what, you know what I mean? Like you get to a point where you like, I guess we've been, we're being vulgar this episode. So I'll just say shit or get off the toilet, right? Either complete the damn set or don't, right? And you know what? As a collector, you could do whatever the hell you want. You could be missing four cards from a set for 50 years. And if you don't care, I don't care. But I care because I have a shelf full of boxes that say 9192 Pro Set Series 2 French set build, and it's missing two cards. And then I have another box that says 9596 Parkhurst European set build. And then I have another one that says 2014-15 OPG set build. And I got like probably 40 or 50 of these boxes. So I finally decided, you know what? I am going to just start completing my sets. I'm going to just start completing them because they're taking up space and I'm either going to complete them or I'm going to get rid of them. But when they're in this like limbo state, I don't enjoy them. They just take up space. Complete set. I will always make room for might end up in pages, might end up in a box in the closet, but at least it's complete and I can move on to something else. So that's my grand diatribe for my reasoning for wanting to do this particular topic plus every now and then people email me and say hey how do you finish your sets i need 14 cards to finish my 9091 pro set set how do i do that well i don't think you need to justify the topic let's be honest most of the people that listen to our show probably fit somewhat in this category as far as set builders or set collectors or even if there's just one set that they do every year like maybe flagship or or something of that nature so I think a lot of our collectors share similar collecting fates, if you will. Hockey and baseball collectors tend to be a little bit more as set builders, and maybe football and basketball collectors tend to be a little bit more hit chasers. Now, I might be wrong about that, but that seems to be kind of like my general impression, like where you and I say, oh, hell yeah, I want a Trevor Zegras Young Guns rookie card but I also want the other 49 young guns as well, right? You know what I mean? Like, whereas I feel like with the football collectors, they only really care about that rookie quarterback and everything else seems to kind of be secondary or tertiary. 
Yeah, and I mean, we're generalizing here to a bit, but yeah, you do see that at least if there's a lot of football collectors out there as far as set builder type, they're not very vocal. <laughs> Let's put it that right. way. Right, right, absolutely. So, you know, if you don't hear them yelling, you don't pay attention. So maybe there's a lot out there, they just are very quiet about it and they don't want people to know that that's what they're doing. So I think the way I want to approach this is I want to talk about some of the online methods of building sets and then sure. some of the more in-person methods, right? Because like I said at the top of the show, you know, this isn't the day where you bring your cards to school. I remember bringing my 85 tops baseball and my 86 tops football in my lunchbox. I'd have them rubber banded by teams because that's how we rolled in the 80s. And you would trade during lunchtime or after school or recess or whatever. That was fun, but that was how it was, you know, 100 years ago. And now card collecting, I can't say that it's less popular with kids now, but I, I think it's less popular with kids now than it was 30, 40 years ago, right? Because there are I other concur. interests. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely if, concur. If anything, it's Pokemon cards, because sometimes I work as a substitute teacher and I will see the kids pull out their Pokemon cards during recess or lunchtime or Pokemon Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever. Me, building sets, I kind of have an approach depending on what kind of cards, like the price of the cards. So first I want to talk about Com C, check out my cards. Because I'll tell you this right off the top of my head. If people say, well, what do you think of Com C? First thing I'm going to say is great selection. Because everybody sends their cards to them and you only pay one shipping fee. The drawback, though, is that you're going to pay a lot. No, I had to walk this back even further. If it is an upper deck hockey card from 2015 16 and onward, Chances are, unless it's a Connor McDavid rookie card or whatever, you're going to get it for a good price because people who buy an EPAC can transfer the cards to Com C. They don't have to pay any shipping fees, right? It boom, it's there. So you could pick up a lot of cards for thirty cents, fifty cents, and that's what I like about Com C. Now, if you need anything prior to that, you're probably looking more in the range of two dollars a card. Why? Because the person has to pack up the cards, they have to ship the cards, and then ComC gets their cut. And when I talked to them about selling cards, and I said, oh, I said, so this isn't really good if I wanted to send you a bunch of dollar cards and 50 cent cards. And they said, no, nah, we don't recommend any card that's under $2 just because of there's this fee and there's that fee and this and that. And the other thing, and I'm just thinking, oh, man, okay, so... I, this is where I see ComC as a great resource. If you're building upper deck sets within the past five, six, seven years, great. Especially if you're looking for those low end cards. If you are looking for those middle of the road cards, those $5 cards that eh, nobody really wants to pay $5 for, then you're going to get them for two or three dollars, right? Like those those kind of mid range cards, like the three to ten dollar cards. That's where I tend to have a lot of success with ComC as well. But then when you get to like the more expensive cards, then you might be better off getting those elsewhere because people are either going to A, put it up as an auction item on ComC, which means it's just basically on eBay, or B, they're going to say, I want $100 for this card. And if you want to pay $80 for that card, it gets a little tricky. You can sometimes make offers. So that's good. There is some haggling involved. But like I said, ComC, I think, is great for those EPAC cards that are physical because you can get those for pretty cheap. I've scored a lot of cards for like 27, 28 cents. I am not exaggerating. And then again, like those five to ten dollar cards, getting them for like three, four dollars. Right. So. Yeah, that was a lot about Com C. I know you've said a lot about Com C, but that had to do more with their shipping problems. What do you think as far as like using this as a resource to like complete your sets? Uh, well, I've been instructed by my lawyers to no longer speak about Com C. Uh -oh. um, so I don't really have anything to add. No, I'm just kidding. No, they, they blocked me on social media and they've never unblocked me. So I'm permanently blocked and banned by them. Wow. Um, we've even been blocked by one person. 
for all the nasty things that I've said about them. No, I mean, I agree with a lot of the pros. Mm-hmm. I mean, from a standpoint of the fact they have a large inventory, they've got variable pricing, you've got multiple sellers at different levels of experience and everything else that you can deal with on there. You have that ability to make offers. Oh, the scans yeah. too. I forgot to mention that. The scans are the actual card that you'll be getting. Yeah, I mean, and that that is definitely helpful. I mean, perfect example is, you know, I'm one of those people that's putting together stuff. And, you know, if there's variants of a card that aren't really necessarily variants, but they're known to exist, I like to add those too. Mm-hmm. So prime example is the 1991 members only stadium club set, the Mario Lemieux one that's sideways. Mm-hmm. Uh, where it says Mario wins MVP on the back. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, there's a little asterisk in the corner. Well, there's a version that has two asterisks. Oh, this. Yes. Yeah, I'm the same way with with those tops inserts, yeah. They don't recognize that as a variant necessarily in that realm. So when you go on Comp C and you look at that card, it pops up. But if you hit the button that says turn over and it turns over every card in their inventory, you can go through and find the ones with the one versus the ones with the two. And if I need one, I'll buy one. If I need the two, I'll buy the two. See, this is why you and I are friends, because we are the same type of collecting weird. Because just the other day I was saying on Twitter on how some of those tops insert stickers from the 70s and 80s, there's like the one asterisk versus two asterisk version sure. which also carried over to the bowman hat tricks and the top team scoring leaders a lot of donruss baseball was like that mm-hmm. back in the 80s uh, in the 90s with you know printing variants and backwards forwards mirror images and all that kind of stuff and you get that a lot in hockey too i mean one of the biggest ones that most people think i'm nuts and i don't do this for my set builds but i do it for my team set builds for my penguin set is for 9091 upper deck and 9192 upper deck i collect all the variants of the holograms oh yeah because there's multiple hologram variants so and if you don't know what i'm talking about on the backs of the card upper deck always put the hologram and in 9091 the hologram was either the 9091 hologram logo or it was what became known as the 91 hologram logo and so you have one or the other and it's a variant some cards have one some cards have another and it really depends upon when it was printed in the production run because i guess they ran out of the one and so they had to start using the next one because i guess those were printed well into the point of them printing the following year yeah so they both existed and the same thing for 91 92 if you remember the comic ball set, they had a certain mm-hmm. one. Well, those stickers got put on the hockey cards too. And so there's there's a lot of variants that way. Most people wouldn't even pay attention to that, but you know, I do. And you can find them on Com C because the skins are there and you can generally pick up what's what on there. So yeah, that's definitely a plus. And look, I'm not endorsing them or anything, but here's the thing. Yes, I had shipping issues with them in the past. They've gotten better. So my con with them would be shipping, but it has gotten better. Somebody asked on Twitter today and I responded to it. You know, my, my order in November of 2020 took six months. My order in January of 21 took three months. My order in January of 22 took one month. Mm -hmm. So they've gotten better. Shipping's caught up. They've kind of gotten to where they need to be back into that position. But what I don't like about that is if we're strictly talking about trying to use it to build a set, what I don't like is the fact that it can get very pricey on comments. Because let's face it, if you have an account on there and you log in, the cheapest price cards you're going to find are 27 cents. Right. They don't go lower than 27 cents. You look at that, though, and say, oh, okay, 27 cents, that's you know big deal. I need 10 cards. That's going to cost me less than three bucks. So what? Well, if you're really putting in some work, and you're trying to complete a set that maybe is a 400 card set and you need 100 cards for it can start to add up and you think in your head holy crap i'm paying 27 cents for common cards which if you remember the old standard in beckett common cards were a nickel right. or maybe 10 cents right. or 15 cents for those minor stars or whatever so 
you got to reconcile that in your head to know that you're paying 27 cents. If you don't have an account on there, they're 57 cents cheapest ones. So that can get kind of pricey for that standpoint. The other thing I don't like about it is ComC has become so, so user friendly. And I know that sounds stupid to put this as a con. It's become so user friendly that it's very easy for people to go in there and use it like their own stock ticker. What I mean by that is the price volatility gets kind of out of control on there sometimes. And you don't see it as much in hockey. You do see it, but you don't see it as much. You get it a lot more in baseball and basketball because of a guy goes out and has a triple double and goes off all of a sudden on comp C his rookie cards that were 50 cents are now $15. And, and it's like because happens the st- seller is changing the price on the yeah, fly. Because the sellers can pay attention to what's going on and they can go in and manipulate their prices and boom, they're changing. It's it because it's all seller managed. So where that's good for a seller, you can control all that. From a buyer standpoint, especially one that's out there looking to do this kind of thing, here's where I would say ComC is good for set builders. Because of the fact that there's so much on there, they have such a big inventory, you can find a lot of the missing cards that you won't find elsewhere. Right. And you're able to pick those out. So yeah, you might be paying a little more for those, but if you're down to only a few here and there and you never see them, you may be able to pick a couple off on there. And that's where it comes in handy because of the vast amount of what's available. All right. So the next one I want to talk about is the Beckett online marketplace, which I've been actually leaning on Beckett pretty hard probably the past eight or nine months when I uh, first started doing this. Because at the time, ComC, you know, last summer, it was ridiculous to get any cards from them, you know, six months, eight months to get your order shipped or, you know, however long. What did that first order that you placed take you, like eight months or something? Six months. I ordered it in November of 2020, and it took exactly six months. Okay. So in June of 2021, I was going to order from ComC. I used to order more from the Beckett online marketplace, and then I kind of stopped, and then I started up again. Because I I looked and I said, you know what? I have this set. It's missing three cards. I'm going to be doing the national next month. Why don't I just grab these three cards that I need and then I can complete the set and then I can try to sell it at the national, right? So that was kind of like what got me started was like, all right, I needed a few cards and I, you know, I had an incentive to try to finish the set. So the lowest price on the Beckett online marketplace is 50 cents. You're not going to find any cards cheaper than that. Okay, so if you needed 30 cards from a set, all of a sudden you're looking at like $15. And, you know, I guess if they're really old vintage cards, you might say, all right, that's fine. I'm completing a set that's worth $200. Sure, I'll pay the $15. But if you're completing a set that's not that pricey, I guess it just depends what you want to pay. Like, I think we'll all bite the bullet and say, okay, this card should really be a dime or a quarter, but I'll pay 50 cents because it's the last one that I need. What I find myself doing when I order from Beckett is you want to try to order all your cards from the same dealer because then you can get free shipping. So what I do is I'll think, what card do I want the most right now? I need three cards to finish this set. Okay, I'm going to focus on that set. And then I'll look and I'll say, okay, this guy has it for 50 cents. This guy has it for 50 cents. This guy has it for 65 cents, eh, but then I start clicking on them. But this guy who has it for 65 cents has the other two cards that I need. The guys that have it for 50 cents don't have the other two cards that I need. And then I think, okay, well, then if I just pay a little more and then I look at the guy who has the one for 65 cents and then I look and I say, oh, you know what? He's got these cards from 2002, 2003. He also has these other cards from 2002, 2003. Oh, and he has some cards from 03, 04 that I need, right? And then I start buying up the cards, you know, because you'll find that a lot of times you'll find guys that like have cards from the 90s, have a lot of cards from the 90s. Guys that have cards from the early 2000s tend to have like a lot from that range, right? Like, you know, you'll find people who specialize more in one sport versus another. If you get enough from the same seller, there's usually a threshold 20 to $30 for free shipping. Some dealers say $20, some say $30, some say $35, some say $25. If they have a lot of stuff that you want 
and your cards are 50 cents each and you're like, oh yeah, I'll definitely pay 50 cents for that card, right? Then it's worthwhile. You can sometimes get discounts on multiples of the same card, but that's only if you are like saying, I want five of these, this particular card. Now this isn't really set building, but I was doing a card show and there were some Chicago Bears football players from the 80s who were signing autographs. So I grabbed a few cards of them and like one dealer was like, oh, if you buy five or more, then it drops from 50 cents to 45 cents. I'm like, yeah, might as well buy five of them, right? Because I was going to buy a couple anyways. That's not always the case, but sometimes you get that. You're not going to really score any bargains on your higher tier cards. If it's a $20 card, they're going to list it for $20 on their Beckett store or they're just going to put it on eBay. Sometimes you'll get a bounce back coupon like from one seller When they sent my order, they thanked me and they said, you know, thank you for your order. Here's a coupon. Next time you order from us, get an additional 10% off and free shipping. And sometimes if you find the right seller, you don't have to pay sales tax. The sales tax laws are a little weird, as I'm finding out. Like one place that I ordered from that was in Minnesota, I did not have to pay sales tax. Another state uh, or another dealer that I bought from, I think in California, I think I did have to pay sales tax. Now, I'm not an expert on this, but from the research that I've done, a couple of things. Some states don't charge interstate sales tax. So then you can literally, you could spend 20 bucks on a Beckett order, not pay any tax, not pay any shipping. But there's some trial and error. Sometimes I'll add a 50 cent card to my cart and then check out and then see that they throw tax on it and go, okay, nope, I'm not going to buy from this guy. I'm going to buy from this other guy. Because if I'm spending $30, I don't want to spend the extra three bucks if I don't have to. Those are my pros and my cons of uh, the Beckett online marketplace. I don't know if you've ever ordered from them. I have. I have a bunch of times. Now, this one, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, namely the fact that again there's a lot of variety but kind of what you were saying 50 cents minimum a card okay so now we've basically taken that 27 cents and almost doubled it Mm -hmm. to 50 cents a card so are you really going to shoot after a pile of comments yeah if you have a couple left to to get and you can't find them anywhere else sure it's a great place to go are you going to dump a pile of a few hundred cards yeah, probably not your best option because again, Com C is anybody, right? What do you have to be to mm-hmm. be a seller on Com C? You have to pay them, right? And send them your cards. That's it. What do you have to do to be a seller on Beckett? You got to go through a pre approval process. Yep. And pretty much the only people selling through their marketplace, with very few exceptions, are mostly dealers. So, if you know anything about brick and mortar shops and dealers, they're going to charge you dealer prices. Mm-hmm. So starting off at 50 cents is a basic thing when other people might be less. Makes sense because that's just really what it's going to boil down to. So that to me is a con because of the price. Um, but again, high volume can get you shipping discounts. High volume can get you, like you said, some of the kickbacks and the coupons and things on for future purchases. So you may be able to, you know, stack a bunch of things together and, you know, all things being equal, it might work in your favor. Where I like to use Beckett Marketplace is if I'm actually looking for singles of rare, rare inserts or serial numbered cards that I don't find and generally don't pop up on eBay. And that's mm-hmm. mostly for either my team collections or my player collections. Mm-hmm. But since we're talking about set building, me personally, I shy away from back in marketplace. Well, we can talk about the other things too, because I mean, people who buy cards online are going to buy cards online. I think. Sure. You know, we're just talking, you know, there, there's right. no and definitive the answer thing. to this. Here's the other thing, too. I mean, like, I find one seller that has the three cards that I need. They're the only ones that have the three cards. And then I look and I say, okay, if I spend 20 bucks, I get free shipping. I'm going to say, all right, what Chris Chelios cards do they have? Oh, they got this 97 score artist proof. I don't have that. Okay, five bucks. Sure, why not? I'll buy it. You know, it's funny. Us card collectors, we would spend an extra $7 so that we don't have to spend $5 in shipping. 
Well, and that's exactly it. You're going to come up with something to try to round out that shipping cost because right. I do this all the time. And this is one of the next ones on the list to talk about, but you know, I can segue into it now. Sport lots. Do it. You know, sport lots is if I basically was told, hey, there's only going to be one marketplace for you to go to buy commons to build sets. Where would you go? And to me, I would pick sport lots. Here's one of the reasons why. To piggyback off of what you said, the reason why I transitioned into that is because many, many, many times I've gone on sport lots, found a bunch of stuff that I wanted, and just left the window open and come back to it later to look more. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, as anybody who's ever used sport lots, and as you know, and as probably a lot of our listeners know, it's kind of a janky website. Yes. Let's be honest. So it's a little cumbersome to navigate. It's a little difficult to search. And if you're trying to streamline it and you don't really know and you're not familiar with how it works, it can be hard just to get to a point where you can make it manageable for yourself. And like I said, a lot of times it's time consuming because you're looking through a lot of sellers, and a lot of cards and either searching by players or by teams or by sets. And you have to look for different search parameters because sometimes they'll come up one way and not another. And so, yes, it is antiquated. It's a little painstaking to get through, but big draw. You're talking minimum 18 cents a card. Mm -hmm. So you're down to 18 cents, okay? So we're not at five cents anymore, people. There's no more nickels. We're not even at 10 cents, but we're at 18 cents. And 18 cents is a lot more palatable when you're trying to build commons for a base set. If you only need a few cards and they're all commons and you can pay 18 cents a card for them, plus a couple bucks for shipping, why not? Especially if you're not going to find them in another place. And the fact that Sport Lots now allows you to stack your shipments directly from them and have them send you the shipments all at once. It's a very convenient thing. One thing about trying to find a variety of things is once you figure out how to use the system and you can find a card that you want, it's definitely worthwhile to look through that seller's inventory because you never know what else you can find. And if you're on a crusade to, like you started off on, you're on a crusade to complete some of these sets that have been sitting around forever, and you have the 91-92 Stadium Club set, and you're looking for all the cards that are missing the Sporting News logo on the back, and all of a sudden you found somebody that has two of them, and you add them to your cart, and you're like, huh, wonder what else they have. And you click on their thing, and you're like, well, I need cards from this 95 96 set i need mm -hmm. cards from this 98 99 set and lo and behold they have all of them so you add all these to your cart and in the end you can find out what kind of setup they have as far as shipping goes a lot of them offer shipping discounts after a certain point and you can get a bulk shipment from a lot of the a lot of these sellers for fairly cheap and a lot of them are reasonable shipping prices and again, if you decide I'm going to order 20 cards from this guy and 30 cards from that guy and 50 from this guy and 100 from this other guy, you can have them all sent directly to one location and Sport Lots will put them in a box and then they'll ship them to you for like one charge. Now, do you have to pay for that person to ship the cards to Sport Lots or do you just pay Sport Lots to ship the cards to you? See, that's what I was a little... They call it box shipping, and I'm confused by this. Um, when you go into the final shipping option, I think it's rolled all together. So, like, they pay, they'll pay whatever their shipping cost is to get it to them, and then you're paying them the shipping that it costs to get to you. So somewhere along the line, it's offset. I don't think you have to pay double. At least that's not the way I understand it. And if I'm wrong on that, somebody please correct me. But I just thought it was just a, a way to get, and not every not every seller offers that. Right. I, mean, I, I have plenty, like I have one guy right now that I've got 50 cards in my cart 
and it's not even offered like the box ship. I mean, it's it's offered, right. but it's no different than his normal shipping. Right. It's, it's like, why would I pay four bucks to have a box ship it when he can just send it to me for the same price? Right. But, you know, some of these shipping costs, I mean, you, you look at them like as far as what I have. You know, this one guy, I have 70 cards and it's six bucks is what his right. shipping cost is for 70 cards. You're not going to get that anywhere else. I placed my first order about two months ago, and I found four cards that I needed, and they were 18 cents each, but they were from Canada. He had the cheap shipping option. And I want to say I paid a dollar fifty or something for shipping, and then the cards were 72 cents, and then there was, like, tax on top of that. So I ended up spending about four bucks for four cards, but I was actually happy spending a dollar a card on those cards because I would have paid a buck a card. So when I saw that he had them for 18 cents, I was like, oh, that's nothing. But then, you know, oh, it's from Canada. Oh, and I'm going to have to pay more for shipping. Um, Whereas if it was like a U.S. seller, the PWE option might be like a dollar. Now, by the way, one thing about sport lots that is hit or miss is that there are cheaper shipping options and more expensive shipping options. When I bought from the Canadian seller, he basically put the cards in card saver twos and then he might have even sandwiched them in some cardboard and he threw them in a business envelope and I got them and they were fine. The second order I placed, it was going to cost me four dollars for the cheap shipping and then I looked and then I saw that the padded envelope was 550 and I'm like okay 450 or 550. Well I'm ordering 50 cards. I'll pay the 550. You know what I mean? Like the funny thing, though, is that I think every single card on this list, well, most of them were 18 cents. I think some of them I spent 50 cents on. And then I think with like tax and shipping, I think my average was close to like 50 cents a card anyway. So it was kind of back to like what I would have paid on Beckett, but it wasn't. And it had cards that I could not find on the Beckett online marketplace because Sport Lots is people saying, hey, I got these cards and I want to sell them. Whereas Beckett, it's going to be the dealers saying, what cards do I think will sell? You'll have dealers who will only list cards from their town or region. Even though they might have tons of other cards, they're only going to list what they think they can sell or they have time to, to list. Whereas with Sport Lots, it's people who are like, I want to get rid of these cards. And they must because they're selling a lot of them at 18 cents. I see a lot of stuff that I need for 18 cents. So it definitely takes time. I think the hardest part for me, and this was the game changer for me, but once I figured out how to search just that one seller's inventory and then just keep at trying, okay, they don't have anything from 91 score hockey. How about 92 score hockey? Oh, and that's the other thing too. Like you can't say 90, 91 score hockey. You have to say 1990 score hockey, not 90, 91. You'll get no results. Yeah, the double um, years for hockey and for basketball, you got to use the first year. But once I figured out that, like, how Again, I Yeah, it's trade, a wonky service, but... Well, that's the thing, too, is that, like, I want to click on their name and then go to their store. But when I click on the seller's name, it opens a pop-up window that shows the their shipping, shipping rates, which is right. not what you would expect. Right. right. And then and I don't then... even know how I get to their... Where I'm just searching them. I click around and then I like, oh, okay, now I'm on the real DFG's part of the site or whatever. And then I can just search his cards and then see, oh, okay, he's got 50 cards that I need from this set. And you know what? They're 18 cents each. Yeah, I'm just going to buy them all because then I'm done with it, right? The easiest way I've found to do it is just yep. go on there, look for a card you want, find whoever you want to get it from, add it to your cart. And then when you open your cart next to their name and their rating and all of that is a little uh, magnifying glass. And if you click on that, it takes you to their page. But that's not the most intuitive way of getting to their like store. I said, it's a janky website. It's a janky but website. If you could get past all of that and figure it out, if you put in the work, it will pay off. Trust me. You know, the only thing that Sport Lots is missing is a little marquee of like text scrolling across the top of the page that says, Welcome to Sport Lots. And it should be like blinking on and off. And there should be like little like sparkles in like the background or something. 
feels very 1996. Look, it is what it is, but <laughs> if you want fancier, cards aren't going to be 18 cents anymore. Right. No, and that's and, really what it boils down to. Yeah, so and, sport lots, I like. I mean, it, it took me a while to get into it, but once it started becoming like, do I want to spend two dollars for this on com c or 18 cents for this on sport lots well i'm going to pay tax and shipping no matter what or on either of these sites so i might as well get the cards for 18 cents and not two dollars yeah and that's the thing i looked at this from a standpoint of what you originally said and this was from a set builder standpoint and most of my sets are not sets made of hits they're common cards they're base cards and i don't want to pay that much for those cards so mm-hmm. 18 cents all day. If, yeah, if I'm I mean, shopping online, I'll go all day on that. In my last order from Sport Lots, I scored a bunch of inserts for 18 cents. And, you know, inserts, people want to charge 50, 60, 75 cents a dollar because it's an insert, one per pack, one for every other pack, one in every four packs, whatever. But these were 18 cents, and I couldn't argue with that price. Yeah, I mean, I've got stuff in my cart. I haven't cashed out yet. I've got some, like, 98 Bowman CHL rookie cards. Well, Hmm. maybe not rookie cards, but first-year cards of some strong NHL players that are 18 cents. Quite a few of them that I have in my cart right now are 18 cents, and on ComC, they were a dollar plus. So if that tells you anything, and not that we're trying to make this into the com c versus sport lot show but hey we have a goal for the show and that's build your set it's a great site for that all right ebay the elephant in the room so what the e stands for elephant elephant yes here's what i'm going to say about ebay you probably find it on ebay if you're looking for it you could probably find it on ebay wasn't Shipping that their was tagline be... for a while yeah, it was i think yeah Shipping, I mean, unless you're buying all from the same seller because you have, you know, millions of people selling stuff, here's the cons. Shipping, you're going to pay taxes. You're going to pay tax on shipping. So that $10 card, $4 to ship. Now you're going to pay $1.40 in tax on top of that. And I get it, but, oh, man, I mean, it's not a $10 card anymore. Now it's a $15.40 card. But I'll say this, though. I would say eBay is the best place to get a deal on an expensive card because it's an auction. And unless it's a buy it now for a ridiculous price, but then even with buy it nows, you might get them at a good price or you might submit a best offer that gets accepted, right? Whereas Com C, maybe somebody says, oh, this card's a $100 card and I want to sell it for $100. And that's the end of that. eBay, they're going to say, I'm going to start it at $19.99. And you might get it for $70, $80 if you're lucky in the auction, right? So I think that like eBay is like where people sell their best cards because that's where they feel like they're going to make the most money. But at the same time, I feel that like as a buyer, eBay is a good place because that's when you're not going to get it for the list price, if you want to call it that. You're going to get it for an auction price. And you know what? If you're bidding on an Alexei Lafreniere rookie card, or if you're looking for one and you go on Comp C, someone, let's just say $100. Somebody might say, I want 100 bucks for this card, right? And you go to the Beckett online marketplace, no one's selling it on there because they're going to be selling it on Comp C or eBay, right? But you go on eBay, you might end up getting it for $70 because there are 11 other people selling the exact same card at the same time and two other people are bidding on a different auction and one wins this auction one wins that auction and then the one that ends at 2 a.m you win that one and then you go cool i got this card for 52 dollars instead of a hundred dollars like somebody wanted on com c for it so that's where i feel like ebay's strength is if you're gonna buy a more expensive card i wouldn't really mess around with like Lots of commons because you're going to pay, what, 99 cents? And maybe they might give you a deal if you buy, you might see buy 10 or more and save 10%. And I've done that before. Again, more so with player collecting. Somebody had some young guns that I needed, some marquee rookies that I needed. And then to round out 10 items, I think I bought some Jeremy Roenick cards just to kind of get me to 10 items so I could save 10%. And I think it also had free shipping, but 
these were like one dollar card, two dollar cards. You know what I mean? So there's good and bad. There's, there's a lot of good and bad with eBay. Yeah, I mean, I share a lot of the same opinions on that. Obviously, the big pro is it's the largest audience there is. Um, and larger audience with more eyeballs looking at auctions means there's going to be more sellers out there selling. So your chances of finding your card, especially if it's a rarer one, are going to be much higher. And again, if you're set building, if you want to finish your set, eBay is the place to go because you can just buy the set. And there's probably plenty of them out there. You can buy them complete. But that defeats our purpose, doesn't it? We're talking no, about building actually, a set. I was going to bring that up because there yeah. have been years oh. where I just said, you know what? I'm buying this damn set and getting on with my life. And I've done that. And it feels good. No, it doesn't. Because I've done it and I felt guilty about it. And I hate that the two times I've done it, I hate both of those sets and I never want to look at them. Well, I got a closet full of sets that are missing about four cards each. I'll sell them to you and then you can complete them. How does that sound? Depends on what they are. I might already be building them. Um, right. Um, but yeah, but yeah so... So, yeah, so you have a large audience, so you can probably find rare items and things like that. But, again, if we're looking at, you know, building sets and trying to find common cards and also your rookies to fill in and, and whatnot, yeah, there's plenty of opportunities to get volume discounts from people and shipping discounts and things like that. But, I don't know, there's so much fraud and cancellations and just poor shipping practices and just high prices beyond belief and, People lying about condition sensitivity on stuff. I mean, I've bought lots on there before where, you know, they claim that they're near mint, especially on older sets. And I'm always leery on that, too, for older cards. But I bought bulk. Well, 300 cards from the 1974-75 set or something. And they'll right. say, like, near mint. Like, yeah, they're probably not near mint. They're probably at least below that if they think they're in that good. And I get them, and there's some of them are bent. Some of them are, you know, corners are smashed. They're extremely off center. I mean, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff with them. And it's like, no, oh, man. Because again, who can sell on eBay? Whoever wants to sell on eBay. Right. You know, there's no criteria to weed that out. So, you know, it's one of those things where I'll go to for cards that I need. I don't generally go on there to try to complete sets unless there's that rare card. Because, like, perfect example 0506 upper deck. I need one card. For mm -hmm. series one and series two, mm -hmm. all of the set, all of the young guns, I need one card. Right. Can I find it on eBay? Absolutely. Yep. Do I want to pay $1,200 minimum? No, I absolutely do not. You can imagine right. what that card is. So, yeah, like you said, you can find anything on eBay. Here's what I would recommend if eBay is your go to place because of you know, again, there is some protection. There is some, a lot of buyer protection. There's almost no seller protection anymore. But if that is your go-to and you like to buy on there and you're always doing it, check out the auctions that people put up that generally read something like, complete your set. And then they'll post whatever the set is. And then if you look down in their description, they'll list all of the cards that they have available for that particular set. And they'll say, complete your set, 12 cards for a dollar, mm -hmm. or 15 cards for a buck 50, each, mm -hmm. or you know, whatever. And then if you go down and look at the description, again, you got to do a little more work than just scrolling through listings. But if you look in the description, they'll list all their cards available. And if you're anything like the rest of us, you have a checklist. And you'll just say, okay, do I need card three? Do I need card five? Do I need card nine? Do I need card 17? And you can just find out. I do that with uh, some uh, rarer sets that pop up on occasion. And I'll pick off a few cards here and there that I'll find that people have. And I'll get three or five or ten or whatever. But that would be my recommendation for that, is to look for those types of things, because that way you can lump a bunch of things together into one get the shipping discount for the multiple cards and knock your price per card down because again you don't want to end up spending two three bucks per card to complete right. set that you need a lot of unless they're actually worth that right and you're right about that so i mean sometimes you'll see somebody selling multiples or uh, uh they'll be selling cards from the same set they might have them in a drop down where you select which card you want. You click add to cart. 
but that might be a little more pricey, like 99 cents a card or whatever. Other times you'll see somebody say, yeah, 10 for a dollar 50. I mean, I remember, uh, this is kind of an offhand example, but I had a set of artist trading cards. I forget the name of the artist, but it was a set of cards from the 90s and it was like fantasy art, kind of like a Hildebrandt Brothers or Ken Kelly or Boris. It was like kind of like one of those sets of cards and it was missing one card. I could not find this card anywhere and I found on eBay and somebody was selling the cards and they were like, pick any four cards for a dollar or maybe it was four cards for two dollars or something and then the shipping was like a dollar. I messaged them and I said, I literally just need one card. I will still pay you the full price, but I just need one card. I don't even want the other cards because I just need the one card to finish the set because I can't enjoy it if it's missing a card. I can't sell it if it's missing a card. I can't really do anything. Like I don't even know how I ended up with this set, but it was missing one card and it was it was annoying me. So then the guy was like, oh yeah, hey man, no problem. Here's what I'll do. I'll just list it for a dollar and you know 50 cents for shipping or something you know what i mean and then i got it for a buck 50 but you know what that was the last one i needed to kill off a set and it wasn't like it was an easy to find set of cards it was kind of like a not super popular set but not a super easy set to find either so you can find it on ebay right as as you said yeah i had i had one of those similar the 1991 impel wcw set oh yeah there was one lex luger card that i needed for like the longest ass time and i could never find it and i saw some guy with a listing like that complete your set and he had all of those there and it's like 12 cards for whatever and i was looked through the list so i was like he's got the lex luger and i bought the auction and then he messaged me and said hey pick out the numbers you need i said i only need this one and he's like, oh, well, let me refund like two bucks and I'll mm-hmm. send it to you. I was like, cool, deal. So like, I know like you're trying to complete a 7172 Tops hockey set. If I needed 40 commons from that set, I don't know if I'd go on eBay. But if I just needed the Ken Dryden rookie card, then I'd probably look on eBay because that's where I feel like. Sure, you're going to find get... the most options for that. Right. You're going to find 12 people selling the same card. I don't even know if it's a $100 card anymore, but the point, it might be more than that. I'm thinking of the Tops one, not the OPG one. But the point being is that you'll get a bigger discount on a bigger card versus sure. like a $4 card. You might get it for $3, but if you need 20 or 30 of them, you're still spending a lot of money yeah. versus if you just need one good card. You know, one website I want to throw out really quick, I will say up front, they do sponsor this website. Their ad is on the side, Center Ice Collectibles. The reason why they're one of our advertising partners on Puck Junk is because I really like their website. The guy who runs the site, his name is Dan, and he specializes in team sets, European issues, oddballs. Yes, he does have all the cards from, you know, Upper Deck and OPG and Tops and stuff like that. Pretty much everything 70, 71 and up is how far back he goes. Pros and cons, I mean, I'm going to be completely honest. The minimum on that site is a buck a card, which if you're trying to fill your 16, 17 OPG set with commons, buck a card, kind of hard to swallow because that's a lot for a common card. But if you say, you know what, I really want a few cards for my Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins set from 0607. He's probably got them. I'll give you like a, for instance, I bought an 8081 Quebec Remparts team set off of eBay. It was complete, but the card of Penguins legend, Roberto Romano, now this is a Remparts set, but that card was creased. The rest of the cards were fine. I went on Center Ice Collectibles. He had that card for three bucks, boom. So I just completed a team set from 40 years ago of a junior team, right? I mean, another time I remember buying, I bought a Chicago Wolves team set off of eBay. It was missing one card and it had another card that was creased. And I was just like, oh man, all right. Well, you know what? I'd rather have almost the entire set than not the set at all. Then I go on Center Ice Collectibles. He had the two cards that I needed for a buck each. So 
every site has its pros and cons, right? And so if you're looking for European issues or harder to find stuff, that's just a good option. So I just want to throw that out there. I know you probably haven't ordered from them, but I just wanted to mention them because like I say, they are a sponsor of the site, but they're a sponsor of the site because I actually really like their website and I like the guy who runs it. And I, I think he does a great job at offering those really hard to find cards. I've looked on their site before. I don't, I don't think I've ever ordered from them. To preface this like we did in the beginning, there's no one answer to this. You got to come up with whatever hybrid of all of these collectively yep. that work for you. Because, I mean, these aren't the be-all, end-alls. I mean, how many times have I said, oh, have you guys tried this new site yet? They said you can buy cards and sell cards and blah, blah, blah. And how many of those exist anymore? None. Right. <laughs> I mean... That's the thing. It's hard to compete with eBay when everybody goes to eBay. You know, Sports Card Direct was around for a while, disappeared. Collector's Revolution, Trading Card Exchange. None of those sites exist anymore. Right. So, you know, other marketplaces spring up, but if nobody pays attention to them, where do you go? ComC has been around quite a while. They're not going anywhere. Becca Marketplace has been around a while. They're not going anywhere. Sport Lots, I don't think it's going anywhere eBay, well, obviously, it's not going anywhere. How about Trading Card DB? Because I kind of thought of that at the last minute, because it's not really a site for buying and selling. It's a site for trading. But this can be an invaluable tool if you're trying to complete sets. For a little while, I was pretty active on the site. So basically, what you could do is you could list what cards you have, what cards you're looking for, what cards you have for trade. I didn't really bother with putting my entire collection on the site because that didn't matter to me but what i would do is i'd put up cards that i had for trade and i'd put up cards that i was looking for and then it like matches you to people and it'll say like they have 18 cards that you need and you have 20 cards that they need and then you can reach out to them and say hey do you want to work out a trade so it is work to log your cards but then it does the matching for you automatically and it could send you emails every day or you could turn those off it's a little hard for hockey traders because you're going to find a lot of people in Canada. And if you're in the U.S. and you're worried about paying a lot for shipping to Canada, that becomes a problem. Although in the past, I've done PWE trades with people in Europe and I've just explained to them and said, look, it's going to cost me 20 bucks to send these common cards to you. I'm going to send them PWE. I'm going to put them in a nine pocket page that I'm going to carefully fold, wrap in paper, put in an envelope and ship to you for a dollar thirty or a dollar sixty or whatever. And I'm gonna send you three of these envelopes and never had any problems. Not saying that there couldn't be a problem, but regardless, trading card DB might be worth looking into. I think I utilize trading card DB I don't want to say every single day, but it's easily four four out of seven days a week. I use that site. Now mm -hmm. I don't always use it well, I don't ever use it to make trades. Have I made trades on there? Yes. Has it been a very, very long time. And that's because I turned it more into my own personal checklist. Mm -hmm. And that's mainly what I use it for, for my player collector, um, because it's a very good intuitive type site to add and create want lists. Mm -hmm. But you're right. The fact that you can immediately create a want list of all the cards you want check off the ones you have whatever's left you can go into the trading function and find all the people that have those available to trade and you can start working out the old-fashioned way of figuring out who needs what and who wants what and get the old trade wagon rolling so to speak so you know we yeah we don't have a school and a lunchbox to carry it with your cards in anymore but that gives you that lunchroom where you can make those trades. It's a kind of a good platform for that. You just have to be careful what you do. I mean, obviously, you don't know the people. Uh, one thing about trading on there is it's a little difficult to know who you're trading with unless you know who you're trading with. People talk about getting vouches and stuff like that all the time. Well, you know, it, it's one of those things. I haven't had any problem with the community on there. I mean, I'm sure there's bad seeds because there's bad seeds everywhere, but my experience with it has been pretty much positive. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've worked out some trades. They've worked out pretty well. I don't think I've had a bad trade on Trading Card DB. 
<clears throat> and you can leave feedback and stuff like that. You know, another similar site that I'll mention, although it's it's really for stickers, there's a site called laststicker.com, and it's kind of the same thing. You input what stickers you have, what stickers you need, and then it'll match you with people. And then you can even, like, narrow down, like, do you just want to trade with people in the U.S.? Do you want to trade with people in certain countries? Do you want to trade with people in any country? Do you want to just trade certain stickers or do you want to look for all the stickers that you're looking for? Stuff like that. So that's another one. Last sticker, actually, they started adding cards to their checklists, but I don't really use them for trading cards because not a lot of people do. Although from time to time, I might see people who say, hey, I'm in Finland. Can you send me some 90-91 Tops hockey or something? And I'd be like, okay, sure. How many do you want? You know what I mean? Like, um, if it's something I want to get rid of. But I think part of the reason why I started getting kind of on this, I don't want to say vendetta, because usually you have a vendetta against somebody. I don't have a vendetta against anybody. You have a, a vendetta fire... against incomplete card sets. Yeah, right. Exactly. I don't want to say I'm tired of trading, but I kind of came to an impasse with trading. If you've listened to this show and we've traded cards before, thank you. I've enjoyed trading cards with you. I appreciate you trading cards with me. I'm probably more of the problem in these trades than anybody that I've traded with because it takes me forever to find stuff for people. And part of that is because is I have so many you damn cards. Both. When somebody just says, oh yeah, I collect rangers. It's just like, can you be a little more specific? You know what I mean? Versus somebody saying, trying to finish my 1819 upper deck set. Okay, that I know where to find, right? But when you just kind of go, oh, I collect players who played for the University of Minnesota Duluth. I'm like, okay, Brett Hall and Norm McIver and am I forgetting anybody? You, you like, know what I mean? I'm out. Like, what, what do you right, I'm out, right. Exactly. They, so and they, um, they send you a list of all the people they collect, and it's like, I collect... Pat Maroon, and I collect um, Mark Friedman, and I collect Marco Sturm. It's like, right. do you think I have their cards lying around? No, sure. they're How in common Marco boxes. They're buried somewhere. How many Marco Sturm cards would you like? So here's the problem that I came up with, and I know this is going to make me sound incredibly cheap, but if I trade cards with somebody, say I send $20 in cards, I ship out $20 in cards, I get $20 in cards, and then I have to pay $5. Maybe that's not the right way to look at it. Sometimes it's like, you know what? I'm getting rid of cards I don't want. So I'm super happy about that. Like one trade I made with a guy who is a senator's collector. He's in Canada. I sent him a bunch of senator's cards. And I was just like happy to like, hey, all right, I'm getting rid of these senator's cards. He was super psyched about them. And then I got back cards that I want. So in a way, I was kind of like, okay, I feel good because... He's really happy with these cards. I got rid of these cards that I don't want. I got cards that I do want. Yes, I did spend $20 on shipping, but everybody kind of wins in that situation. But other times, it's just like, sometimes I'm just like, hmm, I could send this guy $50 in cards and then spend $15 or whatever to ship these cards. Or I could just go on eBay and buy the damn card and be done with it. And sometimes that's just what I want to do. You know what I mean? Sometimes just cash is the easiest, right? I couldn't work out a trade for a Kirill Kaprizov Young Guns card, so I bought one. And that was probably the easiest trade of all. <laughs> because I knew what the guy wanted for the card. He wanted a dollar amount. And I just said, okay, here you go. And I didn't have to send him anything for it other than the money, which was PayPal. So, Yeah, I could see that. And you got to have the right trade partners. I mean, that's that's for sure. Pretty much everybody that I've traded with over the last few years are all pretty stand up people when it comes to hobby people. Yep. I don't know that I've made trades with any serial killers that I know of or um, people that are detrimental to the well-being of the hobby or anything like that. But yeah, you're right. I'm horrible. I'm lazy. It takes a long time to look for cards. I mean, unless somebody knows something like, hey, I'm building this set and this set. Do you have anything? Yeah, I can go right to it right now and I can thumb through them all, find the ones if I need them, and boom, we're done. <laughs> like you said, it's, I collect Rangers. Can you be more specific? 
New York Rangers. Can you be more specific? Uh, anybody that played for them from 1990 until now. Okay. Well, that narrowed it down to nothing because it's everything. 30 so it's years like, of. Yeah. If they're like, I collect Rangers, anything Rangers, just give me whatever. I'll be like, great. Yep. Hope you want a giant box of cards because here right. it comes. Yep. And it's like, you know, those kind of trades I can do because I'm the kind of person where, and I know this sounds stupid and it sounds probably made up and I'm lying, but I don't keep score. Some people do. I don't keep score. So if I just randomly send somebody a package of cards because I know they collect them, I don't expect or want anything in return. You know, obviously, if it's a trade that we've been working out and talking mm-hmm. about, mm-hmm. yeah, we're going to do something. But nine times out of ten, I don't trade based off of, oh, I want that card from you. And, you know, Beckett says it's $18, so i got to find $18 worth of cards to send you back. I don't do that. Right. And this is usually how it starts. Somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, DFG, or hey, Tim, because I go by that, too, sometimes. I got this whatever card. Do you need it? And I'll be like, yes, I do. And they're like, oh, I'll send it to you. I'm like, what do you collect? I'll send you something back. And it's never like, there's no strings. It's not like, well, I think, you know, I think this OPG retro black Tristan Jari card is worth $5. So you better be sending me $5 back. No, it's never anything like that. It is what it is. You send me cards I want, I send you cards you want. And, you know, you and I, have done plenty of these types of trades. Yeah. I don't think either of us really care because generally nine times out of 10, I'm giving you things that you need and you're giving me things that I need off of our lists. And yeah. It was nice it, when we started trading, like when we meet up at shows for the first times and you would just give me a stack of cards and I give you a stack of cards. And yeah, it, it didn't matter because neither of us were keeping score on that. And yeah, my stack might be a foot and a half high and your stack might be three inches high, but everything in your stack is stuff you've been looking for forever. Keep my three inch stack out of this. But you know what I'm saying? No. Yeah, exactly. And I've said that value wise, they might not balance, but in the end, it's like, I'm getting all of these things that I want and I'm checking off this list and being able to erase these numbers off of my checklist is way more satisfaction on whether or not there's a 30 cent difference between the cards that we traded. Right. I remember like another site I used to do trading on sports card forum and there were a lot of work because you basically post a message and say, here are the cards that I'm looking for. Here are the cards that I want. And it wasn't automated where it would like match you. Like you'd have to manually look at this thread and see what they had and then see if you had any. And it was just, it was so much work. But I remember like one time, might have been like say 0708 and somebody was like i'm looking for 9091 opichi and i at the time i was building 0708 opichi and so the guy had like 40 50 cards that i needed and i dug out like 40 50 cards that he needed and i go okay well hey i found like 40 cards that you needed and you have 40 cards that i needed and then he goes oh well those are 9091 opichi cards that you want to send me in According to Beckett, those are only worth a nickel. He said, but these 0708 OPG cards, they have a Beckett high price of 30 cents each and a Beckett low price of 15 cents each. So you'd have to send me six of those cards for one of these cards. And I wrote him back and I said, dude, common cards for common cards. Neither of us are getting any Gretzky's or Crosby's in this transaction. I spent an hour digging through cards, finding ones that you needed. What's the problem here? You know what I mean? But some people, they just get so... They get hung up on price. I mean, like price another time... Perceived like perceived value. Once upon a time, maybe when we were kids, we thought it had to be one for one, or these two are worth this one, or whatever. And now, I mean, I think you pretty much said, like, there are common cards there are five dollar cards and they're like 10 and up right like kind of like how we classify things right like it's a five dollar card yeah and you have to really be you have to really put yourself in a position where you can distinguish what you find to be important right is the card important is the price of the card important is the value of the card important 
is completing the set more important? You got to figure out what your priority is in all this. Because if you're going to do the trading route, and whether you're going on trading DB or whether you still use the forums, like you said, sports card forum. I mean, there's blowout forum still. There's, you know, trading card DB as a forum. I mean, there's a forum on collector's universe. There's, is the bench still around? That used to be one of them. I used to be on a lot of the forums back in like 07, 08, 09. Mm-hmm. 2010 like that back in that time frame i did a lot of trades i even bought cards off of there but again it's a lot of that if you're going to do the direct trade whether you're going to do it through social media in person through the mail whatever it is you're going to do and i'm no expert this is my suggestion find yourself a decent stable of really good traders Mm -hmm. if you can find that and you can keep them in your rotation you will pretty much have an endless supply of people that you can send and receive cards from. Right. And as you get to know what they like and they get to know what you like, it gets a lot easier. Like I try to be that go-to person for when people have Blackhawks to trade, I want them to think of me. And when I get like certain cards from certain teams, I think of certain collectors and and that's good when that happens. You know, one thing I want to talk about though, because I want to get into the in-person methods a little bit, but I just want to touch on social media, including stack sales, which you see a lot on Twitter. So a stack sale is when somebody posts a picture of like, say, six cards or eight cards, and then you leave a message that says, I'll take the Gretzky card, I'll take the Crosby card or whatever. And my problem with stack sales is I'm always an hour late to them when I see something across my feed from like an hour ago and I go, oh, that's a cool Alex Debrinket Young Gun card and I need that and I want that. And oh, oh, somebody already said take. I got a couple problems with stack sales. One is that there's too much real-time competition and I don't wanna deal with that. I just don't wanna like wait for somebody to post these cards. I mean, I've participated in a few, but I think because I'm more of a set builder, it's really hard when somebody posts six Young Gun cards and it's the fronts of the cards. Now, if I was a team collector or a player collector, I could look and say, oh, I don't have that Patrick Kane jersey card. I would like to buy it because those are unique enough. But when somebody posts 10 young guns and you're seeing the fronts of them and then you go, "Okay, do I need a Barkley Goudreau young gun? I don't even know what number that is. I got to look it up. Right. And I look and I go, oh. Yeah, I actually do need that. But then someone already claimed it. And and then also just because then like sometimes the shipping charges just kind of creep up on you and you say, oh, I'll take this card for a quarter. I'll take this card for a quarter. I'll take this card for a quarter. And then the next thing you know, you've bought $25 worth of cards, but then you're spending another $20 or whatever in shipping. I guess if it's from Canada, maybe, or maybe not that much, but I'm being a hater on this. Maybe I just feel left out because I'm always late to the party. I mean, that's the risk of a stack sale. I mean, here's here's the thing. Stack sales are going on constantly on Twitter. And if yep. you're on any other social media that's not Twitter, I don't know if they have stack sales. But on Twitter, they do. And look, you can't follow everybody. So there's probably hundreds of them going on at once. At all times. Every day of the week. Right. And the ones that I find that a lot of hockey people participate in, you're right. There's a lot of eyeballs. Yeah. And there is so much competition for low end. And that's where you're going to find those cards that you're looking for to complete sets. Maybe high short printed, but high short printed ones in the high numbers of some of the more modern sets or rookies that are like the tail end that aren't big name guys and stuff like that. Or maybe you're trying to put together some insert sets and you got some low end insert. The market of people that compete to try to get the low end portions of these stack sales is unreal. It's absolutely unreal. And unless you have stumbled across somebody that's having one at a weird time that no one's paying attention, or you find somebody that doesn't have a whole lot of followers and it wasn't advertised very good. Yeah. Otherwise you're screwed. <laughs> Cause some of these, I mean, a lot of them out there and don't get me wrong. Some of the, some of these guys that have these sales are phenomenal. I mean, the stuff that they have available, it just blows my mind where they get all this stuff, but you know, looking at them, it's like, 
if you follow, like there's a couple guys that sell through stack sales and that's pretty much all they do. And they run them a couple times a month and I watch them. I haven't bought cause I can never get anything I want, but I watch how they go. And if you go back and look at their threads of all of their posts, you know, they might do 50 to a hundred posts in one sale. You go back to the beginning and look at all their 25 cents a card or 50 cents a card or dollar a card or whatever. They have 15, 20 people commenting, but as it gets to the $10, that drops down to like 10 people. And as it gets to the $20, it's five people. And as it gets to the $50, it's like three, so on and so forth until, unless it's something like super rare, or you got a couple player collectors that collect the same card and they, something came up that's like, you know, the Holy Grail type thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Once you get into those higher dollar values, people disappear, and all. Well, that's the thing. You're not going to get you're not going to get that deal because they're going to. You think oh, it's a hundred dollar card? I'd like to get it for less than that if possible. That's not going to happen in a stack sale. You're going to say, "Here's a hundred dollar card," right? Whereas, like the fifty cent card, eh, you get it for a quarter. The five dollar card, eh, you get it for two dollars, right? But like those higher cards, you're not going to get that kind of discount. And sometimes you shouldn't. I also sell at card shows, and sometimes I want to get a hundred dollars for the hundred dollar card. I mean, I sold a card at the national last year. I had it tagged at a hundred bucks, and every day the same guy kept coming over to my table. And he'd offer me $60 and he'd offer me $70. And then one day he pulled out his phone, National's a five-day show. So this kind of transpired over like the course of four or five days. He came over and he pulled out his phone and he said, oh, well, this same card sold in May for $80. So I'll give you $80. And I politely declined. And then like 10 minutes later, somebody quietly just kind of came up, said, oh, I'd like that card for $100, please. And I sold it to him for a hundred. And the guy was like, thank you very much. This was one card I've been looking for all weekend, you know? So there you go. I mean, I get it. Sometimes you want to get what you think is top dollar or what you think it's worth. And other times some people just, you know, they'll say, "Eh, whatever, that's fine. Yeah, this is fine. That's fine. I mean, I'm that way too, depending what it is. Stack sales are not, they're not my recommendation (laughs) for set building. That's for sure. No, no, they're not. Well, let's talk about like the in-person stuff then, right? Like going to shows, going to card shops, right? Shops and shows, the oh. old school way. I said I'm all about old school when I can. So shops, if you find a good card shop that has lots of cards, that can be a great place. One shop that I go to, they're in Morton Grove, Illinois. They're called AU Sports. They have tons of cards their three back walls are just full of 800 count boxes with cards organized by sport by year in numeric order and that's when i'll just come in with my want list and you know say all right i need to check your 93 94 stadium club and i'll just find a bunch that i need and that's when you'll get these for maybe a nickel or a dime or 20 cents or whatever, because it's a card shop and they might have tons of commons and semi stars and they're not going to try to nickel and dime you if you're buying a hundred cards that you need from various sets from various years. Sometimes even, you know, not only will they work with you on the price, especially if it's like commons and, you know, not like they're high end cards, but like you need to finish your 90, 91 score hockey set. Yeah. I'm sure they'll help you out with that. No problem. Sometimes you can even leave a list with the dealer. And they'll see what they can find for you. And then you come back in a day or two or you email them and they'll see what they have for you. That's a good way of building sets. And you still do that? I'll I'll be honest. I don't have the shops that have that capacity anymore. Um, Right. My shop that I've gone to for many, many, many years, that's my primary store, More Fun Sports in Dyer, Indiana. You know, I've known the owner for, I can't tell you how many years. It's been a long time. But, you know, he sometimes has that kind of stuff. But it's not often because nine times out of 10, he's selling the higher end singles out of the cases or he's selling wax and he'll get it if you're looking for it and he'll find it. But to just say, I need blah, blah, blah cards off from this random set, he may not have it. And a lot of times when he does possibly have it, it's part of some kind of collection he bought and he's selling it off as one big thing. 
Mm-hmm. It's like, and he'll always say, like, you want to go through whatever on there, you know, feel free. But it's like, he like bought it from some guy. None of it's organized. It's all just thrown in boxes. So mm-hmm. it, it's a little difficult to do that. And then the other actual brick and mortar shop that's by me I mean, is baseball card exchange. So yeah, they don't really do that kind of thing. It's the retail shop is case singles and it's mostly local market. So the one space in the hockey case is all blackout cards and all the other cases are bulls, bears, cubs, white Sox, right? Chicago fire and all that stuff. And then they have a couple vintage cases with singles, but there's not really anything to sit there and search through or anything because they're known for their boxes. They sell wax boxes and that's right. Yeah. That's pretty much what they're known for that and supply. So I don't really have that luxury to be able to do that. Like you brought up before going to some regional shows, you know, if you can find a few trading partners and set up at those shows and, and trade at those shows, it, it's outstanding. It's great. I mean, that's, that's what the hobby is based on. You know, they're called trading cards for a reason because you're supposed to trade them. So, you know, having that luxury to be able to to do that is great. Not everybody has that capability, but it was fun when we were doing it all the time. Yeah, we had our own little rat pack going. It was you, me, and a guy by the name of Nick and then our friend Justin Godfrey who writes for uh, Raw Charge Lightning Blog. He's their editor now. And, uh, yeah, the four of us would meet up and we would just, like, give each other boxes of cards and here you go, here you go, here you go. How you doing? Oh, my God, this is great. You're giving me, you know, 900 cards that I need from various OPT sets or whatever. I mean, it was a good thing we had going for a little while there. Not yeah, just and you could, and me, but, and you know. It kind of goes back to my point of before of if you can find the people to trade with. And social media has been great for me for that. And I'll be honest, this show's been great for that because, you know, you have listeners that just reach out to you because they maybe heard the show or they saw something mm-hmm. you tweeted online or they saw some a Facebook post from Puck Junk or something of mm-hmm. that nature. And they reach out and they say, hey, I have this card you were talking about on the show or I have all these penguin cards that I don't want. Do you want them? Or I have this or, hey. I heard you talking about this. Do you think you have such and such card? I don't know. I'll look. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you can create that, I call it the inner sanctum. You know, if you can make that inner sanctum and create it however you want, you know, it could be five people. It could be 10 people. It could be two people. It could be 100 people. Whatever you think is manageable. If you can come up with that where everybody trusts each other, everybody understands what the other person wants, what the other person needs, what they want to collect, everything else. You can turn this into a very lucrative way to complete your sets, whether they're regular sets, team sets, player sets, whatever they might be. It can be very fruitful for Mm -hmm. everybody involved if you can get yourself into a position like that. You just got to be willing to put in a little bit of work to be able to do it. Because let's face it, we don't live in a world that's very personable anymore Mm -mm. at all. So it's difficult for a lot of people to go up and just randomly talk to people. And sometimes the in-person stuff doesn't work out too well, especially when you go to the shows. You don't know anybody. You don't have friends. You don't have people that you already set up. Hey, I'm going to bring you this. Are you going to be there on Saturday or whatever? Taking your stuff to a show and saying, hey, I'm looking for blah, blah, blah chances are most of these dealers aren't going to have it because they're not in the business to sell commons. They're just trying to make money. They're going to sell big cards. Now, I will say this because something that I've noticed, big shows versus smaller shows. So your small shows where people set up for a day, they're probably going to bring the big cards, like you said, or they're going to bring rummage boxes, the three for a dollar, four for a dollar type of things that are not necessarily going to be super conducive to set building, although you might find a guy with a bunch of recent inserts and semi-stars and whatnot, and you might sift through it and then find some cards that you need. I I'll do tell you what, shows have been profitable from a standpoint of finding young guns to complete my upper deck sets. Yes. Well, let me clarify, finding scrub guns. 
yes. to complete the sets because there's plenty of dealers at most of these shows, regional, small, and big, that have dollar boxes and things like that, just packed full of nobody young guns that no one's ever heard of that they're trying to get rid of. And so you can get them for fairly cheap. That's been good. But actually searching for the last 50 cards I need for my 0910 Opeachy set, yeah, no, that's never happened and never will happen. That's a little tricky, yes. But I find that like with vintage pre-90, it's a lot easier because like I'll give you like a like a couple of quick for instances. There's like one dealer that I always beeline to his table. He sets up at the fall and spring show, has mostly baseball, football, basketball, but he has enough hockey and he puts them in books and they're organized by year and they're organized by number and everything's priced. And so it's pretty easy to find if he has the cards that I need or not. If it's a really good card, it's in a case. Otherwise, 99% of the cards are in penny sleeves with the price on the penny sleeve and then put into binder pages organized by year. And when I'd be like, oh man, I just need two cards to finish this 7273 top set. I'll go to his table. He'll probably have them. They're a couple bucks each. That's fine. There have been times when I was like building a set and I'd grab like a hundred dollars worth of cards or two hundred dollars worth of cards and he'd look at them and they'd be mostly commons because i was building the set and then he would knock a bunch of it off because you know what okay i am buying a bobby or card for fifty dollars but then i'm buying a lot of two dollar cards and they don't want to take the two dollar cards home they want to sell the two dollar cards they want to get rid of them so then they'll say oh okay well you know i'll knock off 20 percent or whatever but it's easier with stuff that's pre-1990 because it's way more finite. There were less sets to collect. You didn't have 15 different companies making hockey sets. You had two. I know like another time, like I needed like one baseball card to finish a set. And uh, there was a guy with just books and books and books of baseball cards organized by year and by sport. It was a quarter. I was grateful that he brought it. Another time I needed a specific football card. Same deal. Guy had all his football cards organized by year, by number. So you will find that at the bigger shows. The one-day shows, maybe not so much. But at the bigger shows, you can have success at that. But yeah, when you get to like those really specific things, like you said, 0809 Opeachy, yeah, th- those are tough. Th- I mean, right. it's uh, especially those high numbers. Right. And it's not like they're super short printed by any means, but... No, it's just that not a lot of people. Other pack, people didn't keep them around. Right. So, yeah. So, you know, again, some choices are better than others, but if that's your thing, then that's your thing. You got to find out how you can carve your space in that little niche. Right. Yeah. And we definitely want to hear from you if you have a way of how you like to build your sets or complete your sets. Like Tim said, none of these are perfect. You're going to have to use a combination of them. It is trading cards, so trading is a big part of it, hopefully, still. But sometimes it's just easier to go online and purchase them. And you don't want to spend $1,000 completing a set if you can spend $200 completing the set, maybe if you just look around a little harder. Right, absolutely. So anything else you want to add to this before I wrap this one up? Because I pretty much said all that I can say on this topic. Like we both said, there's many ways to skin a cat. You're going to find what works for you. You're going to figure out your thing. And a lot of you are probably listening to this show going, I'm going to call this show episode duh, because we already know all this. Well, guess what? Not everybody does. You know, there's a lot of people out there that maybe the only place that they know of to go to is eBay. Maybe no one's ever heard of sport lots before. Two months ago or a month ago was my first purchase from them. And I've heard about them forever. But even me, an experienced card collector, placed my first order with them not too long ago. Yeah, I've probably ordered off Sport Lots, I don't know, seven or eight times over the years. So it's like if anything turns a light bulb on for anyone, we've succeeded. Yes. And plus, it's you know, we're sharing our experiences, too. We're both longtime card collectors. A lot of our listeners are longtime collectors. Some are new collectors and some are returning collectors. So there's got to be some good information here for at least some of you, we hope. That and the fact that we like to hear ourselves talk. And if you don't, then there's the X. (laughs) Yeah. All right. I think on that note, we'll wrap it up. 
So thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed the show, please be sure to like and subscribe. Please be sure to tell your hockey friends who like hockey and hockey cards. Please be sure to give us a follow. I'm at Puck Junk on Twitter. Tim is at The Real DFG on Twitter. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, you could purchase a t-shirt at shop.puckjunk.com. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at Puck Junk.